Next, we'll introduce Mukoli mentioned in Gagetai Khan, The Road to Kingship. If you haven't seen Gagetai Khan, The Road to Kingship, please click the link to watch it. Next, we're going to tell the story of Mukoli, the first king of the empire, the exciting content is about to begin, so stay tuned. The wild wind was raging, stirring up the dust outside the camp. On the edge of this prairie, the camp of the Jalair clan was quietly located on the east side of the Vertex River today. On that day, a new life arrived on this prairie, he was Mukoli. The atmosphere inside the camp was unusual, yet incredibly peaceful at birth, thick white vapors filled every corner of the tent. As if a mystical energy surrounded the newborn, the local shaman, surprised and respectful, observed this scene, smiled slightly, and whispered, this is no ordinary child. Macaulay's name, like his existence, was unique and powerful. He was seven feet tall, with the head of a tiger and a beard, and a black face. His eyes were determined. Wisdom sparkled deep in his pupils, showing his extraordinary intelligence. His arms were long and strong, showing at a glance that he was a master of archery, drawing his bow. The full strength of two stones was unmistakably displayed, a power that could not be ignored. On the Mongolian steppe, the wind stirred up a sky full of yellow sand. The shadow of war loomed between the Kiat and Jokin clans at this critical moment. But Chino Tamujin, this firm and brave leader, led his Mongolian people into this decisive battle, and in the wheel of this war. A young man, named Mukoli and his brother took the same challenging path, their father. The steadfast and fearless Kongwen Kubuwa led them to Temujin and, in the presence of his grandfather girls Kudabao, pledged allegiance to this great leader. This was a moment that changed Mukoli's life, he stood there. His determined eyes crossed with Temujin's and an unspoken understanding seemed to develop between them. In the cold winter of Mongolia, heavy snow mercilessly covered the land after a lost battle. Temujin and his people were exhausted, penniless, lost in the vast snowfield. With no yurts in sight and no shelter from the wind, they could only lie on the cold ground, enduring the biting cold. Yet in this dangerous environment, Mukoli and Bawachu stood in the snow without hesitation, using their bodies as shields. Staying up all night, holding up the felt to shield Temujin from the cold wind and snow. Once, a small cavalry unit led by Temujin was traveling through a valley, he turned to Mukoli and asked, What would you do if we encountered bandits on the way? Mukoli answered without hesitation. I would use my body to block them. Sure enough, bandits attacked them shortly after. Arrows fell like rain, their sharp points cutting through the sky with murderous intent. But Mukoli showed no fear. He gripped his bowstring and fired three arrows in quick succession, hitting three bandits. Precisely, he quickly dismounted and used his saddle as a shield. Bravely standing in front of Temujin, his fearless courage surprised everyone at that moment. He successfully repelled the invading enemies, creating a solid defensive line for Temujin. In the vast expanse of the Mongolian grasslands, Wong Khan of the Karat tribe and the Naaman tribe were fiercely at war. The flames of conflict burning bright, troops and horses worn out, Temujin, hearing the call for aid, decided to send Mukoli and Bawachu for rescue. Their cavalry was as fierce as wolves and tigers, swiftly and mercilessly pouncing on the Naaman tribe in an instant. The Naaman tribe was completely wiped out the blood-stained grassland, demonstrating their determination in battle. However, in 1203, Temujin and his erstwhile ally, Wong Khan, suddenly split, resulting in a great war between them. And the intense flames of war ignited once again on the grasslands. Temujin initially suffered defeat, but he did not give up, turning defeat into victory, preparing for a counterattack. At this critical moment, Mukoli was once again ordered to march. He selected a group of elite cavalry and launched a surprise attack on Wong Kong's camp. In the darkness of night, the people in the camp were totally unprepared. Chaos and fear swept through the entire camp, forcing Wong Kong to flee in defeat with nowhere to go. Because of this battle, the various tribes witnessed Temujin's courage and determination, and they successively pledged allegiance to him, 
thus consolidating Temujin's position on the vast Mongolian plateau. A great unification, war was burning in a blaze. In this war, Mukoli, with his cunning strategies and excellent combat skills, repeatedly created miracles on the battlefield, winning Temujin's praise and reliance. But this was just the beginning, in 1206. When the great Mongol state was established, Mukoli, due to his outstanding contribution to the unification war, was appointed as a thousand households leader and also served as the leader of the left wing. He ranked third among the 95,000 households, managing vast lands from the Khan's court to the greater kingdom, enjoying great power and status. His descendants also inherited this position, passed on from generation to generation. But Mukoli didn't become complacent with this alongside Bawuchu. He was considered a leading general, always maintaining caution and vigilance. He deeply understood that true courage was not about achieving victory in war, but being able to protect and maintain one's people and land in times of peace, in the endless sands of the Mongolian plateau. For brave and fearless generals fought side by side, they were Mukoli, Borush, Boakula, and Shilon. Their courage and perseverance made great sacrifices and contributions to the unification of the Mongol Empire, they were known as the Dorbanoirat, a term in Mongolian that signifies for braves, symbolizing their valor and wisdom on the battlefield. Mukoli, in particular, due to his outstanding performance, was appointed as the chief of the Kishikten, an honor of the highest degree. He not only won respect in war, but also earned admiration and trust during peacetime with his wisdom and resilience. Entering the early Yuan period, he was even honored as one of the ten meritorious subjects, a title that further affirmed his immeasurable contribution. In the spring of 1211, amidst the blooming flowers, Mukoli led his Mongol cavalry, closely following Temujin, marching eastward. Their target was the Jin dynasty. In the Battle of Washa Fortress, he led the army to a resounding victory, defeating Jin general Wu Jisizhong, capturing the Marshal Guobayu and successively conquering Daton, Chongzhou, Hanzhou, and Fuzhou. However, challenges still awaited them ahead. Wanyan Chengyu, a counselor of the Jin dynasty, led an army said to number 400,000. They were stationed on the Yef Ridge defense line, using the mountain terrain to resist the Mongol cavalry in August. Temujin arrived at Yef Ridge with his great army. He bribed the peace-seeking Jin envoy Shimomingan and learned about the defense situation of the Jin army. He then ordered Mukoli to lead the Mongol army to launch an assault on the Badger's mouth path. As the battle was about to begin, Mukoli stood at the front of the army, raising his long sword high and loudly vowed, no return without breaking the Jin army. He commanded the Mongol army to dismount and forcefully break through the Jin army's defense line. As infantry, pressing directly towards the main camp of the Jin army. Inspired by him, the morale of the Mongol army greatly increased, and they launched a fierce attack on the Jin army. Under this fierce attack, the Jin army quickly collapsed. The Mongol army chased them to the Cow River fortress, and the Jin soldiers fell along the road. Corpses scattered for hundreds of li. This battle of Yef Ridge completely changed the power balance between the Mongols and the Jin, causing the Jin's elite to be exhausted, and from then on, the Mongol army was invincible. The scent of the spring of 1212 still permeated the air. The Mongol army led by Mukoli was already stationed in the suburbs of Dexing Prefecture. Preparing to launch a new offensive, the moonlight was clear, illuminating Mukoli's determined face. He was studying the strategic map in his hands in the tent, and his commanders sat around him, awaiting his instructions. We need to attack Dexing Prefecture swiftly and decisively. Mukoli's short and firm voice echoed in the tent, and everyone could feel his determination. The next day, when the sun just peeked out, the Mongol army was already assembled under the city wall. Mukoli rode his war horse, stood at the forefront of the army, his gaze firmly fixed on the enemies on the city wall, he knew that the victory of this battle was in his hands. At this very moment, Makoli raised his long sword high, pointing at the city walls and shouted loudly, charge for Mongolia. The Mongolian cavalry he led rushed towards the city walls, like a flood, 
and the Jin army quickly collapsed under their fierce attack after the battle. Macaulay, riding his war horse, slowly entered Di Xingfu, looking at this city. His heart was filled with the joy of victory. In 1213, the early spring breeze swept across Macaulay and the Mongolian army led by Genghis Khan. The walls of the Jijing Pass stood before them, but in their eyes, it was just the next target to be conquered. This time, we will show the Jin people the courage and determination of the Mongols under the flag. Genghis Khan's brief and firm voice echoed in the camp. Macaulay looked at his Khan, nodded. With a firm gaze, the Mongolian army attacked the Jijing Pass. With thunderous momentum, and Macaulay's arrows were like the messengers of death, repeatedly breaking through the Jin army's defense line, forcing them to retreat at Huiwi Ridge. The Jin soldiers were defeated by his elite troops. Causing great chaos, the Mongolian army swept forward, with Zhuo Zhou and Yi Zhou falling one after another. Macaulay separately led the army to capture Yi Du, Bing Zhou, and De Zhou. Each victory made his fame even louder. The slaughter in Mi Zhou shocked the entire Jin dynasty, and Macaulay became a symbol of terror and awe. On their way back, they passed through Bo Zhou. The local magnates Xi Qian Ni, Xiao Bo Dai, and others looked at the Mongolian army in front of them, their hearts filled with fear. They knelt down and begged for mercy with no other choice. Macaulay accepted their surrender, knowing that this was another way for him to establish his hegemony. The spring wind of 1214 seemed to carry the traces of war, making it impossible to feel its original warmth. Temujin had already besieged Zhongdu plunging this imperial city of the Jin dynasty. Into an irreparable predicament, the Jin emperor, in fear and despair, offered his own daughter for peace. At this time, Macaulay received a new order. He was ordered to lead the army to fight in Liaodong and capture Gaozhou. His eyes flashed with a decisive light, he packed up without hesitation, leading his soldiers towards a new battlefield. The terrain of Liaodong is tortuous and complicated. A tricky battlefield, but Macaulay's army cut through the difficulties and obstacles like a sharp blade. They rushed through the valleys, aiming directly at Gajai, below the city of Gajai. Macaulay looked at the towering city walls, he knew this would be a tough battle. But he carried the mission entrusted to him by Temujin, as well as the pride and determination of the Mongols, and launched their attack resolutely. Under his command, the Mongolian army came like a tide. And the siege was like entering an unguarded territory in the end. Gaozhou city fell under their offensive. In the spring of 1215, the flowers of Dating Prefecture withered under the iron hooves of Macaulay. And the once prosperous Liaoyong Prefecture had become a field of rubble. The Jin army, led by Autangang, was as solid as a giant rock. With 200,000 soldiers lined up outside the city, confronting Macaulay's Mongol cavalry. But this was just the beginning. Macaulay's gaze was sharp, like a lion eyeing its prey. He ordered his Mongol cavalry to launch an attack on the Jin army. His cavalry was like a series of gigantic waves in the ocean, rolling in one after the other, unstoppable. Autumn Gang, the Jin's defending general, watched this torrent from atop the city walls. His soldiers fell under the onslaught of the Mongol cavalry, like ears of wheat in a field. However, Autumn Gang could only watch helplessly as, under Macaulay's fierce attack, the 200,000 strong army was defeated, with over 80,000 beheaded. With the fall of Dading Prefecture, Macaulay's next target was Xinjiang Prefecture. He sent signals of surrender to the city, showing his credibility and prestige. The people inside the city, who had no strength to fight anymore, accepted Macaulay's call to surrender before the joy of victory could fade. The rebellion of Zhang Jing brought new challenges to Macaulay, however. He was fearless and quickly suppressed Zhang Jing's rebellion, successively capturing Jinzhou and Guangying Prefecture. In the spring of 1216, the flowers were in full bloom. But Macaulay did not slow down. That year, his sword was aimed at Zhang Jing's younger brother, Zhongzi Zhongzi. After the fall of Zhang Jing, led the remaining rebel army, becoming Macaulay's new target. The wind in Liaodong was stirring in Macaulay's tent. He stood in front of the map, hands behind his back, eyes firmly focused on the position of Fuzhou. 
This was his next target. The Mongol army attacked Zhongzhi's base like a pack of wolves. Their iron hooves broke not only the city walls, but also Zhongzhi's mental defenses. Under Macaulay's fierce offensive, Zhongzhi had no choice but to surrender, and Fuzhou was occupied by the Mongol army. The sound of the Mongol war drums echoed in Liaodong and Liaoxi. Heralding pacification, in August of 1217, Macaulay's military might reached its peak. Temujin, the king, revered him as Taishi, gave him the Nine Tassels White Banner, symbolizing the highest power and nobility, and entrusted him with the full authority to attack the Jin Dynasty. With this power in his hands, Macaulay led his war horses. Sweeping across the northern land like a storm, he successively captured Lezhou, Daiming Prefecture, Yudu, Zizhou, Dingzhou, Leizhou, Weizhou, and Zhu, each city crumbling instantly under his iron hooves, dressed in armor, wearing a steel helmet. He stood on the city walls, looking down at the smoky battlefield, feeling decor and fear from countless enemies. In 1218, Macaulay's army flag was like a surging tide, mercilessly engulfing more cities that year. He commanded the Mongol army to break through Taiyuan, Xinzhou, Daizhou, Zizhou, Luzhou, Fenzhou, Huzhou, and Pingyang Prefecture. Each city collapsed instantly under his steel hooves. He led his warriors to conquer cities and seize lands. Their momentum was overwhelming, like a raging storm. He looked up at the sky from atop his war horse, it was an endless sky, symbolizing his and the Mongol army's ambition and far-reaching future. In the year of 1219, Mukoli continued to etch out his legend in the tides of war in this year. His troops rampaged like a storm, consecutively conquering the regions of Keston, Lanston, Huoshan Army, Shizhou, Shizhou, and Jiangzhou. With each advancement, he left his enemies feeling powerless under his fierce attacks. As dawn broke, Mukoli would stand among his military camp, gazing at the far-off beacon fires and cities with fervor and resolution flashing in his eyes. He knew that the fall of each city was a crucial step towards his unification of the northern land. With more and more cities falling under his sword, his name sent shockwaves across the Mongolian plateau, Mukoli, the tiger of the battlefield. Time and time again trampled his enemies underfoot, making them taste the bitterness of defeat. His cold-blooded ruthlessness, his resolute bravery, made him the nightmare in every enemy's dreams. In 1220, Mukoli led his troops to Mancheng. The local Jin dynasty commander, was young, seeing the overwhelming force of Mukoli army, saw no chance of victory and chose to surrender in Zhending Prefecture. Facing this situation, Mukoli didn't indulge in the arrogance of victory, but chose to adopt this advice of Shi Ni. He ordered a strict prohibition on looting the people, allowing them to feel his good governance and benevolence, winning him great public support. With this momentum, Mukoli led his troops to Fuyang. And the Jin Dynasty's Xinzhou commander, Wugui, also chose to surrender upon seeing this later. Mukoli led his light cavalry into Jinnan, the Song Dynasty's Jinan prefect, Yanshi, along with the eight provinces under his jurisdiction totaling 300,000 households. All surrendered to him, however, Mukoli did not stop there. In the fierce battle at Huangaling Gang, he dismounted to lead the battle personally to inspire morale, letting his soldiers witness his determination and courage. He ordered his soldiers to draw their bows together, striking the enemy with immense firepower, ultimately under his leadership. They defeated the Jin army, which was said to be 200,000 strong, successfully capturing Waijou and Danzhou. In the winter of 1221, Mukoli did not halt his campaign. With an iron-like determination and unparalleled courage, he consecutively seized Jiazhou and Sui Di, dealing another blow to the Jin army, to the east of Yonon city. He used his sophisticated military tactics, setting a cunning ambush on the cold night. He led his army to hide in the shadows, waiting for their prey to arrive. When the Jin army unknowingly walked into their trap, Mukoli troops suddenly launched their attack, catching the Jin army off guard. In this night battle, Mukoli Mongolian army defeated 30,000 Jin soldiers, killing over 7,000, showcasing his high military talent and strong leadership. 
In the spring of 1222, Mukoli Grand Army was ready to strike, setting their sights on Jingjia Prefecture. But this sturdy city didn't fall as easily as his past enemies. With 200,000 Jin soldiers guarding the city, causing Mukoli offense to be momentarily thwarted, facing such a predicament. Mukoli did not show any sign of retreat, his eyes only reflected determination. He decided to leave 6,000 elite troops to stand off with the Jin army, and dispatched 3,000 men to hold the vital Tungwon to prevent reinforcements from the Jin army. Next, Mukoli decided to lead his main forces to the west. Targeting Fingxiong, however, the defense of this city was equally robust. And even after more than a month of siege by his troops, it could not be captured. Mukoli browsed forward deeply. He understood that to defeat the enemy at once, a new strategy and determination were necessary. In the spring of 1223, Mukoli finally reached the end of his life. Despite being far from his hometown in Wenxi, surrounded by war and gunpowder, he remained steadfast in his loyalty to his country, loyal to the last moment. Bedridden and plagued by illness, his life was coming to an end. With his deathbird becoming his battlefield, however, his gaze remained firm. Filled with a desire for victory, before his death, he expressed his final wish to his brother Dasem. I have contributed to the great cause of our nation, donned armor and wielded weapons for nearly 40 years, fought in the east and west. I have no regrets, only the lingering regret that I have not yet taken beyond you. You must strive on. His words were full of expectation for the future. Entrusting his brother and filled with the heroic sorrow and helplessness of the battlefield. But in his final moment, there was no fear, no retreat, only deep loyalty and endless anticipation. The death of Mukoli was heartbreaking. His loyalty and bravery deeply imprinted in everyone's hearts, his son Bolo inherited his title, leading the army to continue the campaign against the Jin with his father's expectations. Later, Temujin personally came to attack Fengxiong and said to his generals, if Mukoli were alive, I wouldn't have to come here to supervise the battle. This statement further highlights the importance and greatness of Mukoli in the Mongol Empire. Mukoli was a military commander with a keen strategic vision and excellent military talent. His courage and wisdom played a vital role in assisting Temujin in unifying the Mongolian tribes his irreplaceable contributions to the unification and expansion of the Mongol Empire and his life itself became an important chapter in the history of the Mongol Empire. If you like this story, please help us by subscribing and sharing. Thank you.